Hello, Justin. Hello, Yule. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Welcome to Formosa Staff Training Research and Development Branding Strategy Conference. It is the first online conference for Kase. My name is Ming Zhong. CEO of CASE. On behalf of the organizer, I would like to extend my warm welcome to all the guests to the online conference. Now, I would like to invite Professor Yuan Xiaowei, Director of CASE, to deliver her welcome speech. Let's welcome Professor Yuan. Thank you, Ming. Um, we have 60 attendees from 37 universities to join us online. This is the first time to work with THE, Times Higher Education, for the online conference. This conference aims to increase the awareness of current analysis of university rankings for Taiwan University by introducing the data analysis and research methodology of the world university ranking. We are so glad that we have a president from Wenzhou Dashue. Zhang Shida uh, and Donghua Daxue, Xiao Zhang Men Hao. And we also have Yan Fa Zhang from Chenda. Yan Fa Zhang Hao. Um, to introduce two speakers from THE, the first one is Justin Tai. Please wave your hands. Hi, everyone. Yeah, THE's regional director of um, general manager of Asia. Justin came from an audit, accounting, and credit ranking background. He is now based uh, at the THE Singapore office and oversees THE strategic partnership and initiative in Asia. And the second speaker is Elaine Chen. Please wave your hands. She is a higher education consultant at the THE with seven years experiences in the global education sector. She had lead the University of British Columbia's international student recruitment efforts in Hong Kong, Greater China, and the Asia Pacific region. She's now based in Hong Kong. Thank you to both of you. Um, I'm going to introduce Gasse because I think uh, a lot of you heard about Gasse, but you don't know the idea about Gasse. So, I'm going to give you the PPT. Okay, GASE uh, is founded by most Ministry of Science and Technology, uh, stand for Center for Global Affairs and Science Engagement, launched on November 2018. It's a joint initi initiative by most and National Taiwan University HQ and designed as a university center structure with 15 university members in the steering committee. You can see these 15 steering committee university members in Taiwan, but also GASE is served for all the universities in Taiwan. GASE uh, plays a very critical role for the partnership. And then from the academic research part, we have University Institution of Scientific and Research Association and also work with 15, let's say, member of the university. But from the advanced R&D practical application, we work together with uh, NAR Labs and also 121 partnership with foreign institution and over 100 embassies and foreign missions in Taiwan and with a smart machinery office, Taiwan AI labs, etc. The mission of GASE is to foster global partnership and nurture global talents and strengthen Taiwan's R&D global presence and also facilitate science and technology policy. So under these four missions, we have uh, hold, held a lot of uh, different activities. Later on, we will see on the videotape. And these are the overseas science and technology uh, 
divisions. Almost crossed the whole world with 17 branch office in 13 countries. To explore our potential collaboration with GASE, welcome to contact us. We are here, sir, for the university in Taiwan and also want to reach out for you. We want to play a critical platform for you to join us. Please watch a videotape. The Ministry of Science and Technology, Center for Global Affairs and Science Engagement, a leading institution aiming to build and facilitate global partnerships. Collaborating with some of the best minds around the world, we strive to create cross-national science and technology linkage, encourage international exchange of talents, and maximize Taiwan's power of innovation. Leveraging a tighter network of global partnerships, GASE is dedicated to create positive impact through international cooperation. Bringing continuous encouragement and inspiration, we work closely with our global network and universities to host conference, workshop, seminar, and summer program for aspiring talents, young scholars, and people from all ages and professions. To mobilize Taiwan's best R&D power, we have 15 leading university members working together on the SA Steering Committee. To create closer global scientific community, 17 overseas science and technology divisions are established in 13 countries on the most. Driving visions forward, GASE, your gateway to global GASE's global connection and hope you enjoy GASE. So now let's welcome Justin to give us a welcome. Justin? Sure, thank you so much for the enlightening presentation. Can you hear me well? Right, I'm going to share my slides. Uh, I only have a couple of slides. Um, did you see my slides? Right. First and foremost, good afternoon, uh, presidents, vice presidents, deans, directors, and distinguished guests. Thank you so much for spending this precious afternoon on Friday to join us. I'm standing in between you and the weekend, so I want to make sure we end off on a good note. Uh, I'd like to thank the moderator of this event, Gassi, director of the UN, as well as the MC, Gassi's CEO, uh, Ms. Cheng. Uh, Lydian and Ms. Cheng have been instrumental in organizing this event for us, together with the help from the team, Lisa, Ming Chen, as well as Kwame. Uh, this is the first online conference by GASE, and PhD is really honored to be co hosting this alongside GASE. Um, as mentioned, I'm the regional director and general manager of PhD in Asia. I'm based in Singapore. A little bit of help from the financial institutions. I was at this institution called Fitch, the credit rating. And that was before I joined the rankings. So I went from ratings to rankings. And I'm blessed with a beautiful wife and three kids. Right. I'm going to start with some uh, basic intro on PHP, just six slides. So bear with me. I know a lot of you have heard of PHP, you know about PHP, and we have many old friends here. But at the same time, we have new ones. And I don't want to assume that all of you know about it. Uh, as mentioned earlier on for the questions, let's leave them all to the end. You can uh, hand down your questions in the chat box and we'll answer the questions at the end uh, because of time constraints. So I'll jump into sort of the introduction for PhD. Right, so this is this is how we started. We started in 1910 on the back of the Times newspaper. Many of you would have, would have heard of Tao uh, Sipa, right? So that's how we started on the back of the Times newspaper. Back then, we were called uh, Times Education Supplement. In that in the one, we became a bit more colorful. We went into magazines uh, and we rebranded ourselves as PHE. And it's only in 2004 that we launched the first ranking, the World University Rankings. Right? 
in 2016, uh, this was actually one of my first few projects uh, I was involved in Japanese ranking. We started uh, not just Japanese, but also the US teaching rankings. So these are the teaching rankings. And our latest milestone would be the impact rankings. Many of you would have heard of the recent results that came out in April. Uh, some of the Taiwan institutions have done very well. Right? So that was the latest uh, milestone for PhD. You see that in this uh, entire transition, PhD has moved from being a news publisher to a data publisher. Nonetheless, in all this, we are very proud and honored that we are very much serving the higher education community, uh, universities, governments, last century, right? always been our focus, university. Um, despite the sort of move from uh, being a publisher to a data institution, we still very much retain the media influence. It is a media company to begin with. So uh, we uh, work with the best uh, minds involved. We work with academics, we work with students, uh, and these are just some members we're very proud of, professionals as well as students with good members. And again, in terms of our media outreach, in terms of our influence, here are some numbers. Uh, frankly, these numbers are a bit outdated because since the COVID the last couple of months, we've seen a lot of people stay at home and they've gone online, they've looked at their phones more frequently as a result, all our numbers have gone up. So these are pretty much outdated. This is our international reach. We work with many universities, as mentioned earlier. Uh, all universities are unique, they have different missions, they have different focus. Uh, and it is not possible for us to include every university inside, but this is just a good spread of you know, sort of all the universities we work with. Right? Um, I always like to uh, retell this story. When I first started, uh, I went to it was about 2015, 2016. Uh, I went to Tsinghua for the first time and met the president, President Xu Yong. And I recall him telling me that, uh, that Justin, uh, I'm very happy with THE. And I asked, so why are you happy with PhD? Is it because you have gone up in the ranking? And his reply to me was that, uh, no, it's not because of you know, the public trend, although they have done well. But it is because I've written an article in a PhD magazine. And as a result, I made new friends. People have reached out to me. So that, that, that taught me two things. One is the influence of the PhD editorial uh, element. And the other one is that we work with so many universities in different areas that sometimes we lose track. Right? Um, some of these universities, they have written articles for us. Some of them have uh, uh, used our recruitment services. Some of them have hosted events with us. Some of them have helped us develop our ranking methodology, so on and so forth. Right? So work with them in many areas. Increasingly, we also work with the corporates. Right? We are seeing a lot more uh, corporates want to work with us. Um, and a lot of them actually are from two states. One of them is the tech field, the other one is the financial institution. We will be familiar with some of these brand names here. Uh, Tencent, Lenovo, LinkedIn, uh, Microsoft, Huawei, right? And of course, we have some financial institutions that are partner with us. So this is our, uh, our list. Um, we also work with many governments uh, in the world. Uh, you name it, we probably have some form of partnership with them. Um, again, I can't put everything down, but I just want to pick up a few uh, in Asia Pacific. So, for example, on the left in India, um, this is the president of India, well, the former president of India. He was there to launch our BRICS ranking. And on the bottom left, you would see the uh, chairman of University Grants Commission, beside myself. We were there to discuss the India rankings, the NIRF local ranking. And then on the bottom left, you would see, uh, beside myself, that is the Minister of Education for India. Again, we are there to discuss uh, our local ranking methods to develop white papers for them. On the right, you will see uh, China. We are very proud that we were the only one mentioned uh, in the People Congress speech in March. Uh, on the bottom right, again, we were the only rankings mentioned. It's a bit small, but you can see on the first paragraph, uh, Thomas Higher Education, right? So this is uh, again mentioned. Uh, in fact, we were the only rankings mentioned in the reform package by the Australian government. Uh, you will frequently see us uh, in most of the government websites. Uh, the one on the left, the Russian, uh, Russian 5100 project. On the right is uh, Minister Ong from Singapore. Uh, Prime Minister Ong was there uh, a couple of months back to talk about uh, sort of policies and advancements in the higher education space for Singapore, the higher education system. So if you with us, if anywhere, uh, our academic 
So all this is uh, publicly uh, available, and you can find that we work with uh, many institutions, uh, many uh, operations, as well as uh, many universities. And our mission is to help them understand the higher education landscape and to develop their policies. So um, that's a very short, very quick introduction about AG. I know a lot of you are familiar with us, so I'm not going to spend too much time. Now we'll hand over to the MC, uh, Ms. Chung, to your presentation. Okay, thank you, Justin. Um, next, we'll start session one, research insights, performance, and trends for Taiwan universities. And let's welcome Mrs. Elaine Chan to deliver her speech. Thank you, Elaine. Floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Great. So I'd like to echo Justin's gratitude for Guest Day and hosting today's event. It's an absolute pleasure and privilege that we have such a large group of higher education leaders across Taiwan joining us for what I hope will be an insightful and thought-provoking dialogue. Um, I am joining from Tichi's Hong Kong office, where I am based. I moved to Hong Kong eight years ago from my home in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, I am part of TEG's consultancy team, and we work closely with universities and governments to achieve sustainable growth and strategic impact by providing data-driven guidance. And actually, prior to COVID-19, I often traveled to meet with our clients face-to-face, -face with um, and also with those of you in Taiwan, which I miss very much. I miss the people, but of course, I also miss the food. And although I can talk more than an hour about the delicious food in Taiwan, I'm going to spend the next hour talking about the topic of research insights, performance, and trends for universities in Taiwan. Okay, so in the first part of my presentation, we're going to focus on TEG's world university rankings and the historical performance and trends of Taiwanese universities. We'll cover a bit of methodology so um, some of you may be more familiar than others with PhD's methodology. So we want to get a good foundation and understanding of the metrics and data behind the rankings. Then we'll take a closer look at the areas where Taiwanese universities show strengths relative to other institutions within the Asia region, and also areas where there could be opportunities for some growth. In the second part, I'd like to speak about THE's newest addition to our rankings family, the impact rankings, which is the first global attempt to measure universities' progress, specifically around impact and sustainable development goals. I'll take you through the methodology, which will hopefully give you a good grounding about what we're trying to achieve and the approach that we're, we've developed. We'll look at some of the results of the ranking and as Justin mentioned, some Taiwanese universities have actually performed quite well. Um, we'll look at some regional and global comparisons with a focus on um, Taiwanese universities' um, performance across the 17 SDGs. And finally, we'll highlight some of the top performing Taiwanese universities in the impact rankings and do a bit of a deep dive into the metrics and the indicators underpinning these SDGs. So to kick off, let's start with um, the World University Rankings. So our flagship analysis, the World University Rankings, was published annually since 2004 and have had a very tight focus on research intensive universities in which a core of their mission is research. In 2020, there have been nearly 1400 institutions, including this um, um, included in this rankings, which all meet a particular threshold of publications um, in order to be able to participate. So under the World University Rankings um, umbrella, we also have a range of perfor uh, performance metrics um, and that measure very much a large proportion of it is on research. And we publish a series of regional and thematic rankings, including the geographical rankings, the young university rankings that rank universities that are less than 50 years old, and the subject rankings. Along with the academic reputation survey that we conduct annually, we produce the world reputation rankings, which looks at the world's top universities based purely on their academic prestige. The second aspect of the university's mission we're trying to look at, and starting around 2015, is the teaching mission. And we do this 
through country-focused rankings that are based heavily on feedback on students. So this includes the college rankings in the U.S., which we publish in the Wall Street Journal, and the, J the Japan rankings, which um, also look at the teaching mission. So, of course, um, the third mission of universities we're trying to measure, which is another area we're going to discuss today, is impact. We published our first ranking this um, last year, um, and this is our second cycle. And this grew out of the initial idea we had around innovation which is something we've always measured as part of the World University rankings by looking at knowledge transfer, in which um, the proxy to measure this was the university's ability to attract industry income. But, but we wanted to look at impact uh, more broadly. And so we had implemented the framework and, um, that the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals um, was looking into. And we'll get into this in more detail in the latter half of this presentation. So at a glance, our World University Rankings looks at five pillars, teaching, research, citation, international outlook, and industry income, and 13 metrics. Okay. Within the teaching pillar, which accounts for 30% of the uh, rankings, it measures more of the learning environment as opposed to um, student outcomes. So it includes the reputation survey, which reflects your ability to produce excellent graduates, we also look at staff to student ratio. We take on this Humboldtian ideal of research that a rich teaching environment is provided in a rich um, research environment. So we're looking at doctorates to bachelor's ratio okay? and also um, bachelor's uh, awarded, uh, doctors awarded to academic staff. Okay? So in a global research intensive university, the supervision of doctoral students is vital. So we measure your university's capacity to support the next generation of researchers. And we also look at resources um, as an institutional income. Okay. Under the research pillar, we're looking also at the reputation survey, which adds a qualitative measure of your institution's reputation for generating quality research. We look at your, the ability of your academics to attract funding in the form of research grants or contracts which is also normalized by the size of uni university and also the subject. And we also look at productivity. And what I mean by that is uh, we look at the volume of publications in a five-year band, which is also normalized by academic and research staff. The citations pillar is the largest um, standalone uh, component of the World University Ranking. And we use the measure of field weighted citations impact or SWCI calculated by the average number of citations that a piece of research from an institution receives. SWCI allows more accurate comparison between institutions by normalizing each publication according to the year and the type and by subject. We look at international outlook, and for us, it is a fundamental uh, part of global research universities. Um, you have to be connected globally, which COVID-19 has really shown to us that more than ever, this is really important. And so we're looking at whether or not you're collaborating and how, how deeply you're collaborating with universities internationally. And we also look at how well you attract global talent in the form of students and faculty members. And finally, um, as I had alluded to before, industry outcome. This is our nod to the knowledge economy, which we've taken this as a step further in our impact rankings to look at this more broadly. Okay, But for the purposes of the World University Rankings, we're looking at the ability of your institution to draw funding from commercial sources. So uh, the data sources that we draw on to inform our rankings uh, come from three places. So the first of which is what we internally refer to as the portal data. And what this is, is the institutional data submitted by universities globally um, on an annual basis. We also look at um, reputation survey. And what that is, it's an annual survey conducted to ask academics who are active in research to nominate universities they regard as producing the best research and also the best teaching. Our bibliometric data is provided by our partners at Elsevier. Okay. 
Um, and so uh, the three data sources feed almost equally into our metrics and our pillars to perform our rankings. Now that we have the methodology down, I'd like to talk more about Asia and Taiwan's performance in the global context. So how are Asian universities doing overall in the world university ranking? Uh, well, about five years ago, we had about 844 universities that were eligible for the rankings, and 220 of which were from Asia, just over a quarter okay, in 2016. Now, fast forward to 2020, we have nearly 1,400, and more than a third of these universities are coming from Asia. So the overall rankings itself is growing rapidly, but in fact, Asia is outpacing the growth of the rankings. So the reputation from Asia is growing quickly. Uh, however, when it does come to performance, Asian universities behave quite differently than the rest of the world. So, so what I mean by this is that if we look across the 13 metrics, um, uh, sorry, this is quite a busy chart, I, I realize. Uh, what we have here is a box and whiskers chart. And each, each metric has two box plots. plots. Okay, the left one, the, the darker color one, represents um, Asia, and the one on the right, uh, the one with the white box, represents uh, the rest of the world. So you can see very quickly that there are some metrics that perform significantly lower in Asia than universities in the rest of the world. For instance, now I hope you can see my cursor. Okay, citations. Um, 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 you notice that Asia does, uh, performs lower than the world distribution. Okay. And also in areas like teaching reputation and research reputation are also areas generally that um, Asian universities do struggle a little bit with. Okay. And part of the reason for that is due to the age of the universities in this region that tend to be younger. So an area where Asian universities do very well is industry income, her staff, it's excelling. So um, higher education is used as a means to transform the econo economy from manufacturing to a knowledge-based economy. So the tight collaboration between higher education and industry in Asia is, is more robust. Now, if we look at this um, in the context of Asia versus um, Taiwan, uh, Asia being, again, the darker box um, on the left and Taiwan being the lighter box on the right. We see two areas that stand out here where Taiwanese universities do not so well uh, relative to their peers in Asia. So, so these metrics are related to the doctoral environment. Okay? And um, I have a few hypotheses for this, and this is something I'd really you know, like to get your feedback on as uh, leaders in the sector in Taiwan, but perhaps this may be due to more macro trends, such as the aging population, but also citations as well. Uh, Taiwan um, institutions don't perform quite as well relative to the distribution uh, within the rest of Asia. Now, areas where Taiwan, Taiwanese universities are performing very well relative to the rest of Asia is teaching and research reputation. Okay. Also, productivity, as in publications to staff. And also research income um, is significantly, uh, it's performing significantly greater. Um, it's, and also industry income, which is already strong in Asia, but even more so in Taiwan, and also international students. Now, if we look at Taiwanese um, universities' performance over time, we see that there is an improvement in some metrics but a decline in others. So uh, moving across time, the darker um, it is, the more uh, uh, in the past it is. So 2018, 2019 to 2020 um, is the lightest box, okay? So the doctoral environment we notice is shrinking, which may have links to productivity, which has also have more or less stagnated. So bringing in international talent may be more important than ever before for Taiwanese institutions. And we see this, um, that there have been significant efforts made in this area. Um, we see an improvement in international um, staff and also collaboration with institutions globally. As well, Taiwanese institutions are making gains in teaching and research reputation. 
And with the increasing research funding quite a bit, um, what I see is that the, the box, which is the 50 percentile, um, or the middle 50 percent, is wider, which signals that there is a wider range of universities with different funding models and different research missions represented within the uh, world university rankings. So it will be interesting to see in the coming years if um, the impact of this research income will have on areas like productivity and the quality of research, such as citations. So another perspective to look at the metrics is to align the metrics to the research life, uh, life cycle in terms of inputs, so um, what you're putting into the research, so the people, the context, and, and the money, um, and the actual doing of the research itself, which you know we're not in the lab with you, so we don't necessarily measure that, and the outputs, which is the um, publications. And uh, finally, um, recognition in the form of research reputation and citation. So how many times is your research um, cited um, um, across the globe? So as you'll notice, um, it is heavily weighted towards the end of the research cycle. So 48% um, reflects a more results-oriented set of weightings in the rankings. So if we take this idea in mind and we look at some of the inputs and outputs, okay, the focus often in the world university rankings is on the top tier elite universities um, in each region or country. But what I'd like to focus on in the next few slides are one tier below, which is where the, a large segment of institutions fall within the middle 50%. If we think back to the box and whiskers charts that I had shown just earlier, the box representing the middle 50% of the distribution, and we slide that across the horizontal, it leaves a ribbon. So you can see the performance trend over time. So let's start by looking at funding in terms of research income for academic staff. So in the first chart, looking at Japan versus mainland China, the mainland China story is often one about significant growth. But when we look at funding, it may not necessarily be growing as rapidly as some may think, particularly in this perspective here when we're looking at the middle 50%. Nonetheless, it's still growing, whereas in Japan, what we see is a narrowing of funding over time, which I hypothesize may be due to the funding model uh, becoming more and more homogenous. When we look at South Korea and Taiwan, what you notice is both of these places are increasing the funding quite a bit. And the width of the ribbons are much wider, which can mean that there is a wider range of universities with diverse funding models, as I had mentioned before. Another input in the research life cycle, besides money, of course, are the people that are producing the research. And in an ideal world, if we have the funding and we have the people both going in an upward trend, then we can hopefully expect that this will be reflected in the outputs in a few years. However, in reality, it's more of a mixed picture. And this is where we see another side of the mainland China story, which is less optimistic. In that the ratio of PhDs awarded per academic staff seems to be on a gentle decline, but has shown a little bit of stabilization in the last year. Similarly, in Japan, where we see um, it's something similar, which is a general decline that has picked up again in the last two years. In, in the second chart, we see South Korea in the green. Okay, we saw a lot of research funding in the previous slide and also lots of people to conduct this research here. But unfortunately, in Taiwan, we do notice a narrowing over the years, as we touched on in a previous slide, maybe possibly due to the aging population, I would be very interested in, again, some feedback in this area about um, some external factors that you think may be contributing to this decline. So now that we've explored the inputs of the research life cycle, people and funding, let's move on to um, talk a little bit more closely about some of the outputs. So looking at how often research is cited as a proxy for um, research out, uh, for research quality, we see a sharp upwards for mainland China. Remember, however, that the inputs of this investment in funding and people have been put in quite a few years ago. 
and we're seeing that the positive outcomes is, is represented here. It'll be interesting to see as funding and human resources seem to be stabilizing in mainland China, whether this trend will continue. In Japan, unfortunately, it has stagnated in this area. Uh, Taiwan, unfortunately, is going downward as well. Uh, Taiwan is going, um, is, is putting in quite a bit of money into research, um, as we had seen earlier. It is not yet paid off, but hopefully the situation will improve in the next um, year, years to come. So to try and tie the idea of research inputs and outputs together, I'd like to take a, I'd like to plot a couple of metrics against each other to try and see which regions have that had utilized the research funding most effectively. Uh, so essentially we're looking at value for money. So in this case, the x-axis is uh, the research income and the y-axis is the citations. And these are the scores in the 2020 World University Rankings. Each dot represents a university and the different colors represent different regions. What we see is that if you take a vertical cross-section, okay, Given the same amount of money, what we notice is that institutions in mainland China and Hong Kong often come out at the top. Whereas in Japan and Taiwan, we generally see that it's relatively lower. South Korea often falls in somewhere in the middle. For Asia universities, this is a challenge, partially because of age. Some of the best known universities um, average um, in age less than 300 years old. If you notice the scale here, most universities don't score above 20. And now this is just the middle 50%, right? In terms of reputation, some of the top institutions are higher. So, so unlike the top tier universities in mainland China that are rapidly increasing their reputation globally, the middle 50% is actually declining in reputation. Japan as well, you see a downward trend. And in Taiwan, the middle 50% has shown gentle improvements in the last few years. So now we talk about input in terms of money, people, and the outputs in terms of quality. The final area I'd like to discuss is the context of which the research is being conducted. Having the right research environment is, is vital. And what we see is that for most places, they are putting in a lot of effort into the area of internationalization and seeing improvements in staff, students, and international collaboration. South Korea is a top performer in this area, and China is improving. Taiwan is also climbing significantly in internationalization. The only exception is Japan, which has unfortunately been stagnating. So what the World University Rankings data can also tell us are how different subjects may perform across different countries and different regions. So, so what we have here are uh, various charts. Um, and the size of the bubble um, are the number of universities ranked. Okay, so the, the larger the bubble, the more universities, right? And, and the closer the bubble is to the outer part of the circle chart, the higher um, that particular subject is scored. So the subjects on um, the left part of the circle are the more STEM-focused uh, subjects. And um, on, the, on the right are uh, subjects that are more focused on the Sorry, I made a reverse. On the left, it's the STEM subject. On the right, it's more subjects focused on arts and humanities, social sciences, business and economics, and law. So what we see is that China is outperforming Japan significantly in STEM. Um, to provide more context, however, China has many more universities that are not captured in our global rankings. And if they were included, it might be a little bit of a different picture. In Japan, however, even though it's a one-tenth of the size of China, it has more universities ranked in clinical and health than China, but both of them are not doing so great in other non stem related subjects. If we're looking at South Korea versus Taiwan on the right, uh, South Korea is stronger um, in terms of uh, STEM subjects relative to Taiwan, with the exception of clinical and health, where Taiwan actually is the top performer in the Asia region. Taiwan is also stronger in arts and psychology, whereas South Korea is relatively stronger in social sciences and business and economics. So that covers um, a little bit about the research trends across the region and within Taiwan. I'd like to switch gears now to talk a little bit more about Taiwan in the 2020 University Impact Ranking. So again, I'd like to first cover the methodology and what we're trying to achieve. 
which will hopefully give you a good grounding on our approach. We'll look at the mechanics of how we store the data and evidence um, universities have provided to us, and also what the data can tell us about how universities in Taiwan are performing. So, so early on, we decided that we should measure universities' impact against a global standard. And, and the standard that we chose was the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So why did we do that? So the goals were adopted by the UN in 2015, and they are universal. They don't look at sustainability through just a very narrow window, um, but through a much broader lens. Importantly, measures do not look at sustainability separate from economic growth. And it was adopted by governments across the world. And by showing the work that universities are already doing in this area, uh, we hope that we could support their case for funding and visibility by demonstrating to their prospective governments that they are contributing towards the key goals that the government has prescribed to. The challenge is the goals themselves don't directly uh, talk to the universities. It's generally designed for government and everyone. By, by nature, the goals are, are very general. So when we built out the approach, I had to understand how universities might work towards the goals. So we superimposed what um, has been described by Duncan Roth, our chief data officer, as a, a theory of change, which describes how a university might affect and demonstrate progress towards the goals. So the first area we're looking at is research. So if your university is doing research in the area of goals, clearly you are progressing towards them. So for example, if you're researching into um, battery technology, that has a clear impact. Um, that has a clear impact on um, SDG 7, clean energy, and 13, climate action. Okay. All right, I just received a request that I don't understand. It's requesting me to annotate, but I'll, I'll just ignore it. Okay. So um, the second one, um, one we look at is stewardship. So, so how universities look, look after the resources, such as how energy efficient you are. But, but besides physical resources, human resources can also be considered. Are you actively being a good employer? Are you a good custodian of your students? And next is outreach. So, so we're looking at the work that universities are doing within their local, regional, and national, and global communities. And finally, teaching. Are universities adequately teaching both to supply the workforce that will deliver on the SDGs and that students will go out in the world as graduates with sustainability as part of um, their skill set? So every time we created a metric, we try to match it to one or more of these areas. So, so for example, in this case, zero hunger, okay, SDG2. So, so the research um, is looking at working with, uh, we're, looking, we're working with our bibliometric partner Elsevier, where we look at a keyword search that are associated with, with SDG2 and explore what these publications tell us about the university. Stewardship, how the university potentially is responding to student hunger within the student body. Outreach, how universities are working with, within their communities to address hunger. And finally, teaching, okay, the proportion of graduates who have a degree in agriculture with elements of sustainability built into it. So we took the decision to be able to identify progress in each individual SDG, all 17. But we have also decided to create an overall ranking to, to understand the broader mission that universities are doing. So, so each individual SDG has its own ranking, but we also have an overall. So within each SDG, we have a series of metrics and associated with those are specific measurements that we ensure are linked to the unique targets set out by the UN. Some are more of a direct link, like around publications and sustainability reports, but sometimes they're more indirect. Uh, but we try to ensure that we can see a conceptual link between what um, we, we are trying to measure and the targets that the UN are trying to deliver on. So in this particular ranking, equity was very important um, um, as part of our consideration when developing the methodology. When we think about the fairness, we need to think about it in different dimensions. So first, we wanted it to be a very inclusive 
uh, rankings as possible. And so to do this, we wanted to make it easy to participate in. So we appreciate that this ranking requires significant effort to collate data that may not have been gathered in a central way before, um, but, but we did not want to enforce that universities had to submit the data to all 17 SEPs to be ranked. Um, but we also recognize that different universities in different parts of the world may have different, different capacities for this kind of data collection. So universities can actually just submit in a single SEG and be ranked in that single SEG alone. But, but to be included in the overall, uh, what we have implemented is that universities need to submit to SEG 17, which is Partnerships for the Goals, which we feel is the overarching aspect of particularly towards cooperation. SDG 17 plus three other SDGs that they can choose themselves. So we hope that this would minimize the data collection. Uh, we also hope that this would allow universities to flex and better reflect their own individual challenges and unique settings. So we deliberately picked metrics that reflect equity rather than pure quality. And what I mean by this is that if we look at the world university rankings, we do a lot of work that is fair, that, that universities don't have an advantage by being a very large university or a very small university. You know, we normalize um, the metrics often by size. Within the impact rankings, some measures from poorer countries will have metrics that are actually to their advantage because they have greater need. And, and we think that, that this is justified given the nature of what it is we're trying to measure. So an example of this is um, the measurement of first-generation students at the university. So these are students that have nobody else within their immediate family had to have attended university, and from a country that has a very uni uh, that has universal higher education, like Canada, where I'm from, it's, it's harder to find students where nobody from their immediate family has been to university. So we also acknowledge that we won't be able to get this ranking perfect. Okay, this is a highly complex area, and we will bring in our own privileges and perspectives into it. So we're open to input from yourselves. If you look in, uh, look at things we're trying to measure, and you don't believe it reflects your uh, university or your context, we hope you can um, um, give us feedback. We're constantly um, looking for feedback, and we actually hope that we will change this ranking um, throughout because aspects. For example, um, pay equity. If that has been achieved globally and everybody works perfectly on pay equity, wouldn't that be so great? Then we don't no longer have to measure it. So, um, if we move away from looking at traditional data like we do in the World University Rankings to looking at qualitative, qualitative data input or evidence-based data, um, we we need to be um, as objective as we, as we possibly can. So, uh, for example. Um, when we're looking at um, affordable and clean energy, okay? So the university provides us with insights about the work that they are actively doing and provides us evidence in terms of local community outreach. So the university will send us specific examples, not everything, but, but a typical example of how they're doing this. Okay? And we built out an approach to scoring. When we look at evidence, there is, um, there is a subjective element. So we try to minimize the subjectivity. We, we um, accept um, submissions in multiple languages, um, submissions and evidence in multiple languages. And, and we also consider the cultural situation. What is the legal situation? Um, as well, we built a scoring mechanism okay, for this as well. So where, where evidence is provided, we evaluate if it's relevant. So specific um, evidence will, will give you a full point. point. Um, if the evidence is uh, general, we'll generally give just a half point. And a good example of this would be a leaflet talking about the work the university is doing towards um, advising on insulation uh, of, of properties in their community. So, so we also ask if the evidence is public. It's important because it gives credibility that the evidence is genuine. So if you put it on, on your website, your community can challenge you on that particular piece of evidence. Or, or on that particular um, uh, service or um, uh, that you're providing. So, so for, for example, in SDG 11, um, are your buildings being open to members of the public, such as the library? Um, you know, somebody can knock on your door um, during the opening hours that are published in um, SDG 11 of the library. 
So, so how do we go from individual SDG scores to the overall ranking? So um, the, we look at, again, I mentioned this already, but we look at SDG 17 plus the three highest. There is a potential for some SDGs that because of the questions that we are asking, it may be easier to score high or more highly than others. So we took a deliberate decision not to bias one SDG over another. Uh, before we pull scores into the overall, we scale each SDG, where the top score is 100 and then the lowest score is zero. So we stretch out the scores across each SDG. We keep the bibliometric data relatively the same, so the research element, although there is um, a research element, uh, and although there is still a research element in this ranking, it's, it's much smaller than the World University ranking. Okay, it's only 27% uh, as of this 40 and 43 um, in the World University rankings, depending on how you look at it. So that's just a very brief introduction to the methodology. I want to talk a little bit about um, the 2020 results and what we have seen globally. So I had mentioned that um, our, our goal for this ranking is that it, it, um, it's inclusive as possible. And we're very pleased that, that in, in our first two ranking cycles, we have seen participation across the globe from countries from um, lower income groups as um, measured by the World Bank and also higher income groups, but it's not skewed towards those institutions for higher um, income groups. So what we've noticed is that there is a quite, quite a good representation of universities doing really well um, in the impact rankings that they may not have done so well in the, the world uh, university rankings, which makes sense because they're measuring completely different missions. So what we can see in this map here, the number of institutions that have submitted, over 850 institutions across the global globe have submitted for our 2020 rankings, um, and that had grown um, from the previous year. We have a good representation from East Asia, 214 institutions. Not, not, unfortunately, not such a good representation, representation from North America, um, with only 56 institutions submitted. So the distribution of SDGs that universities have chosen to supply data to across the world is not, not even. And, and the most popular one, um, excluding um, um, SDG 17, is SDG 3, with good health and well-being, particularly from universities associated with hospitals, in which SDG 3 fits very closely with their mission. SDG 4 is a little bit, bit actually less obvious, although it's based around quality of education. It, it's this SDG itself is not necessarily focused on higher education. Okay, so, so we submitted it to SDGs, include SDG 2, Zero, Zero Hunger, 14, Life Below Water, and 15, Life Online. Partially because these are new SDGs this year to the ranking, and universities are coming to terms with questions that we're asking. But once we have this baseline, we can use this across different regions to test the hypothesis about whether or not universities are choosing to focus their submissions around addressing their own unique local problems or challenges that they're facing. So if we look at this just in East Asia, it's a zero of horizontal represents percentages across the world, we can see which SDGs um, universities in East Asia focus on uh, more problems. So this is um, the number of submissions. Uh, this is uh, represents the submissions. So what we see is that SDG 6 is, is very prominent. Indian universities are doing particularly well in SDG 6, clean water and sanitation. But also there's a strong focus on SDG 9, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. So, so if we look at Taiwan, we've had 26 universities uh, submit across um, um, the 17 SDGs, including the overall. And, and this just shows the volume of submissions for um, each SDG. So, so for the most popular SDG, excluding 17, we see is um, partnership. Uh, uh, we see is good health and well-being, uh, SDG three, SDG twelve, responsible consumption and production, which explores how universities are working towards an efficient use of resources and a minimization of waste. SDG 9 is, is also very frequently submitted in Taiwan. Industry, innovation, and infrastructure, which explores how universities drive innovation through links with industry. 
and SDG 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities, exploring how universities act as custodians of heritage and environment in their communities. A sustainable community must have access to its history and structure in order to thrive, and this is something that we, we treasure. So amongst the top, um, there are a number of Taiwanese universities that have performed very strongly, and I'm going to take back, um, the next few minutes to highlight some of these. So um, in the overall ranking, so these are universities, again, that have submitted to SDG 17 plus three other SDGs, 24 Taiwanese universities have done so, and they have been ranked out of the 766 rank ranked institutions for the overall ranking in the world. So um, the top two in Taiwan are NTKU, National Chang Kong University, ranking 66 in the world. And um, also National Cheng Hua University the of Education ranking, um, sorry, NTQ is ranked 36 in the world, and National Cheng Hua University is ranked 66 in the world. Well, the other universities actually make up the top 200, uh, 250 in the world, so we see a really strong representation of Taiwanese universities in this ranking. So I'd like to do a little bit of um, a preview and a deep dive into um, some of the best performing Taiwanese universities by select SDGs. And then this, this analysis is actually taken from our tool, um, um, SDG dashboard tool that is available to all institutions that submit to the SDG um, to, to assist a particular ranking. So um, in this case, we're looking at China Medical University in Taiwan that scored number three in the world for SDG3, Good Health and Wellbeing. Okay. But we also see six others, um, um, Cheng, uh, Chenggong University, Taohsiung Medical University, and Taipei Medical University, Zhuqi University, and also um, National Taiwan University um, that have ranked among the world's top 100 in SDG3 for Good Health and Wellbeing. So very, very strong performance across the board here. So this particular SDG looks at three metrics on research, the number of graduates in the health professions, and also collaboration in health services. Okay. So at the indicator level for research, all research metrics are measured against the keyword um, search on the scope of data set. And, and these are the keywords that um, have been pulled. Okay. So these have been developed by Elsevier, the Blue Metric Partner, and, and this narrows the documents that you've evaluated so those directly related to the SDG. The keywords are publicly available online on Mendeley. So good health and well-being um, looks at paper reviews. Um, so, so the number of times the papers have been viewed. Um, for a portion of the university's research papers um, that are viewed or, or downloaded as well. Okay. So if we look at clinical citations, the measure of the proportion of the university's research papers that are cited in clinical guidance. And publication, which, which looks at the scale of research output in the university around good health and well-being. So, so uh, what we can see is um, you know, a number of universities within Taiwan um, and their performance in the world distribution. So, so the dots here are um, the particular Taiwanese universities and how they have performed. Now, in order to understand how a university is supporting health professions, we measure the proportion of graduates who receive a degree associated with a health-related profession out of the institution's total number of graduates. And then this metric tries to show how universities are contributing to the education of health professionals. So, so China, a medical university here, you know, in the black dot, performing in, in um, scoring full points here. But we, but we also see that quite a number of other Taiwan universities have also performed very, very well. Now, at metrics related to health impacts, so universities need to also demonstrate actions to improve local and global health and well-being. So, by having current collaborations with local, national, or global health institutions to improve health and well-being outcomes. Also, we need to deliver outreach programs from projects in local communities to improve and promote health and well-being. We also look at whether or not the institution share sports facilities with the local community, for instance, with the local schools or the general public. We look, we look at well, um, whether, whether or not the university provides the students access to sexual and reproductive health care 
Tech Services, including information and education services. And we also looked at uh, whether or not the university provides students and staff with access to free mental health. And finally, we look at if the university has uh, has a mobile free policy. Okay. So, so again, we can see um, across the global distribution how Taiwanese um, institutions are performing on each of the particular indicators. So, so that's, that's a little bit of a deep dive into um, what our SGG um, impact dashboard has, has to offer. Um, um, and I hope that was that was a little bit of a sneak peek. Um, so I'd like to wrap up my presentation now by doing um, some very uh, general uh, conclusions about what we have just spoken about. So we started off by, by talking about uh, research performance. So we looked at um, how many universities perform relative to the rest of Asia. And what we found was that how many universities show strength in teaching and research reputation relative to Asian universities. If we look at across the world distribution, it's still a challenge for Taiwan universities and Asian universities in general. Um, as well, um, Taiwanese universities show strength in research productivity relative to um, the rest of Asia, research income, and also international students. So research quality, as measured by citations and practice, has also shown a downward trend in the last five years. But with, with the, the uptick in investment in research, as we have seen, um, in the upward trend of research income, there, there is a possibility that that trend may reverse mainly in the near future. In terms of subjects, Taiwan institutions are performing in the best in the Asia region for clinical, preclinical, and health. In addition, institutions in Taiwan are performing relatively strongly in art and humanities and also in psychology. Over to what we discussed that's about um, how are Taiwanese universities are performing in impact and sustainable development. The universities in Taiwan are very well represented among the top institutions in the world, with 12 universities in the world's top 250 ranked in the 2020 impact rankings, which, which demonstrates to us a strong commitment to, to achieving the sustainable development goals. Data, data also shows that universities in Taiwan show a very, very strong participation in, in SDG 3, which is, which is good health and well-being, SDG 9, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities, and, and SDG 12, responsible consumption and power production. And finally, we do see a strong performance from Taiwanese universities, particularly in SDG 3, with six universities ranked among the world's top 100 and China Medical University brands in the top three in the world. Okay. So that wraps up my presentation. Um, thank you very much. I hope that this has inspired um, lots of questions, which I will be taking along with Jonathan at the end of our program today. Thank you very much. Now we will have a break for five minutes. Attention, the chat room will be open for questions from now. Learn how to raise your questions with the slide instruction on screen. And make sure to ask your questions in the chat room in time. Due to time limit, we will collect questions online to have interesting discussion later with the speakers. The second session will be uh, will begin at 15 minutes before 3 o'clock. Please come back in time. Thank you. I hope all participants of honor return to your seats soon. And we will take this opportunity to share a video from THE. From left off to arrival, it's 8.5 minutes. My journey to space took 20 years. I read all the pages from all the libraries. Learn from the minds that won Nobel Prizes. The raw classics, minds that created tomorrow. I 
took the city as an explorer, ate with strangers from the same bowl, laughed, partied together, became a family. I learned to be a great leader and a better follower. I exposed myself to failure and succeeded in epic ways. On the way back, I thought that was the end of it. I stepped out, removed my helmet, and the wind came blowing on my cheeks. I had completely forgotten about the wind. How marvelous it is. Ignition. That's when I realized the ending was just a new beginning. Lift off. Lift off. Wow, very interesting. Thank you for THE sharing with us. Now let's welcome Justin to begin his speech on internationalization and branding strategies for research institutions. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much once again. I uh, hope all of us are back. Um, just to give us a bit of a context, the reason I showed the video is not because I'm from the University of Jodai. I've actually showed this a couple of times because I personally find this one of the more emotive uh, videos. Right? It makes you feel like you want to go back to school after watching this, or you want to go to Tokyo. So, um, you know, it evokes a, a reaction from, from most people who have watched this. Uh, that's why I thought it's a really excellent uh, branding, excellent video. So today we're going to cover uh, very quickly uh, over the next 30, 40 minutes about brand strategy. There's a lot uh, packed within this 30 to 40 minutes as much as I can, of course, uh, ask, uh, answer some of the questions. Now, the, just to manage expectations right from the start, I myself have not a consultant. Um, you know, I don't have the, the level, requisite level of experience, but I have done a lot of work with universities, with government agencies, even in my previous roles, right? So I think there is a, some things I can share, perhaps. And I won't be surprised there will be some uh, brand communications, marketing experts here. Uh, administrators have done this for a long time, right? But I suppose for the average person here, you're probably not an expert in this area. So this presentation has been dumbed down a little uh, for the average audience. In case you are way up there, you know, in case you find this too elementary for you, feel free to just uh, you know, excuse yourself, right? I just stop, right? So um, I want to start by sort of giving us the context because it, it's often uh, quite challenging to, to jump in straight away. And I, I find one of the biggest blockage or biggest hurdle is to challenge basic assumptions that most academics and administrators have towards branding. Right? And these are the two biggest uh, assumptions that I find uh, sometimes hard to sort of uh, untangle you know, within the minds of academics as well as uh, key administrators. One of them is, I'm as good as I'm good. And the other one is reputation and brand is not that important as long as I have good research, right? Uh, in my role, I had the opportunity to speak uh, with uh, many presidents, vice presidents, directors. And this is one of the biggest disconnects I find, helping them understand that these assumptions are not entirely true, right? It's almost like, um, you know, you would say of Apple, Acer or TSMC. These are very famous brands, excellent products. I, mean, I think no one will, will deny that. Um, and it's almost as good as saying that uh, just because they have excellent products, excellent teams, therefore there's no need for them to have a positive brand or to do branding. Branding is not necessary for them. But you and I know it's not true because these companies actually they do a lot of it. Right? I've just taken this uh, online couple of uh, um, advertisements from Apple. The one in the middle is for Acer, and if you, if you realize that this this lady is familiar is because this lady is actually uh, Megan Fox. You know, from the actress from Transformers, they must have paid her a lot of money just to, you know, advertise for, for Acer. And then, of course, you have the very famous uh, Pride of Taiwan, right? Uh, TSMC, 
right? You can see that uh, they do quite a fair bit of advertising, right? So um, I just want to challenge this assumption. And before we start, I would like us to have sort of an open mind, right? Um, well, in some cases, it is true that if you have really the only product in the world or you have the only vaccine, right? Since now we're talking about COVID, then maybe there's no need for you to do too much of that sort of a branding, right? But in, we know in most cases, most universities, there is, you're not at that level. You know, there is a need for us to educate our audience, right? So this is the challenge, as I mentioned earlier, and maybe some of you have seen this before, right? The little kitten thinks that, you know, I'm the tiger, you know, I'm just as good or not better than anyone else. And that brings me back to uh, one of the conversations we had with one of the best universities in London. And we spoke to the VC and the VC was just telling us, you know, I, I'm very sure that in this area, in this area, we are the best, best five in the world. You know, but then we showed the VC the data and it shows that actually not true, you know, you're actually far from that. You think you are the best, but actually it's not what everyone thinks of you, right? So um, this is definitely something that I want to challenge today. And hopefully you will find um, you will gain new ground on this insight to progress. Now this is a good friend of ours, uh, Merrick, uh, president of University of Toronto, and this is what he has to say. Uh, many academics find it uh, find it this tasteful concept. I think partly because it connotes ideas of superficiality and shallowness, and it does not really speak to the substance of what we do, referring to academics and researchers. Whether you like it or not, universities have a brand. It is an image that people associate with us. And we want that image to be as positive as possible. Right, so this is from the president itself. So what is a brand? A brand is basically what you stand for as a university, uh, as a researcher or as an administrator. This is what you promise, right? And three points I'd like to stress over here. It should differentiate you. You should be able to rise above the noise. There's a lot of noise like right now. Right, even the research space. It should be authentic, right? Uh, because anything else, and if it, uh, um, it crashes, you know, it really affects your reputation as you will see in later case, right? And if you don't do it, very importantly, it will be done for you. Whether you do it yourself or not, someone else will do it for you, right? So this is important that we take a proactive step and we um, sort of um, handhold our audience, and help them understand what we stand for as a brand. This is a recent article, maybe just about two weeks old from Bloomberg. And you could see here the, uh, you could see this actually coming up in the mouth of um, Donald Trump himself, who was kind of recommending this earlier on. Um, Hydroxychlorine queen fast has tragic consequences. A rush to publish, uh, looking at the first line studies based on false science gets us no closer to cure and hurts public trust. Right? And I don't want you to read the whole article because it's quite a fair bit, but just a small uh, sliver here. Last week, a uh, highly respected and peer-reviewed journal, the Lancet, uh, retracted a bombshell study that suggested uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, and tested potential treatment for COVID-19 was linked to an increased risk of death and health ailments. And you can see related to this, it's uh, this chart here, erosion of trust by public so my point of sharing this uh, in conjunction with the three points is that it is increasingly getting noisier in the research space, right? There is uh, obviously good and robust uh, debates, counter arguments, but it is increasingly getting noisy. Everyone is trying to help teach each other. Um, so even if you have the best research and reviews, you know, if you cannot uh, rise above the noise, it is quite often that you'll be seen as just part of it, right? This is, I think, a only accepted understanding especially right now, so intense. So this is uh, from the corporate world, but it does have some principles we can pick up from, right? So Warren Buffett, very famous investor, CEO of Berkshire had, had this to say, your premium brand can better be delivering something special or it's not going to get into that, right? And then we could say it's simply, uh, it's gonna be the same for students. And students. These are your primary, uh, primary stakeholders. And if you're not going to deliver something, as you stated in your brand, or your brand, your brand doesn't explain anything significant or anything unique, you're going to lose uh, traction with your students. I think all of us will recognize that. Now, um, I want to talk about rankings. Uh, I will show you the reason why I talk about this at this juncture later, right? But if you look at this, uh, the main rankings in the world, right? 
Uh, again, like what uh, Elaine mentioned earlier, uh, even for THE, there's no perfect ranking, but we are all striving to be better, especially for THE. So I'm not going to do a comparison of rankings, but I want to point out a couple of uh, uh, points, right? So you can see here that there is a reputation element even in the ranking themselves, right? So for THE, it's 33%, and then for the QS ranking, it's 50%, right? And this is actually related to my next point, uh, which is why uh, I would say reputation is important because good reputation not only helps you to attract students, it helps you to attract academics, partnerships, and more importantly, as I've shown in the earlier slide, it helps you to improve your ranking. And quite often, all these three points are related. One affects the other, right? So it's really very important to have good reputation because you are able to effectively kill three birds with one stone if you have that good reputation. And nowadays, we know in this very competitive age, um, you know, we see what, what is happening in Australia, you know, when COVID hits them and they're not able to get in students. Uh, it's not just the quantity of students, it's also the quality of students, right? So I think, um, you know, for all of us, you know, we don't just want quantity, we really want to attract the best, the best uh, human resources, student as well as uh, talent. So this is the sort of a uh, million dollar uh, uh, Questions, you know, I've often been asked by, by presidents and, and senior academics, you know, so you, you, you tell me that reputation is important. Fine, you know, I'm not in this space, but can you explain how can I improve my reputation? It's quite a good question. And really, there isn't a, a, a one solution that would, would be able to address this very broad uh, subject, right? So, what we have uh, figured out through our research is that there are a few areas you need to look at. One is obviously the participation of speakers and key events. Right, we see that a lot of universities, especially the high-profile ones, the best universities in the world, they do participate very frequently in the, uh, the top events in the world. Um, definitely on the left, uh, world-class teaching faculty. There's no doubt, uh, you know, good students will bring you good. Uh, sorry, good faculty will bring you good students. And will raise uh, even better students. High-impact research uh, partnerships are really important, and of course, um, uh, alumni networks. And um, today I want to focus a little bit on the last part on the right, uh, communication strategy, right? This is really important as well. And in fact, it does connect a few other elements that we'll see later. And communication is one bit, but there is also the other bit of advertising and branding. Uh, again, I said that this is no uh, silver bullet, right? It doesn't uh, solve everything overnight for you, even if you, you know, invest a lot in advertising. We, we don't believe in that, in fact. Uh, but we believe that a strong reputation is built uh, deliberately uh, over years and, and it's impacted by many of these factors and good branding is just one of these many factors. So I want to cover a few points today and the first point I want to cover about five points. Uh, again I said that these are actually not rocket science but I want to emphasize on some key uh, I would say elements within this this point. First it's know your target audience better. Right? Know your target audience better and I've highlighted target. Right? It's really important that you know your target audience better if you could ask, um, if you could answer this question, right? What is the difference uh, between uh, this uh, four advertisements? Um, obviously, you may not be able to answer it over the chat, group, but you know, just have the answer in your mind. You look at these four banners, and if you could tell me what is the similarity and what is the difference between this slide over the next slide, I'm going to show you in, in just two seconds, right? What is one common similarity in all these four banners, and what is the difference between these four banners? And this four bands, right? Can you compare with this four? What is the answer in your mind? And you may have some answers to point, right? So obviously, most of you will probably get this right because it's very clear. I deliberately make this make this very clear because I want you to be able to see the difference. One advertisement is obviously targeted at professionals, and academics, and the other one, you know, study here, study now, study this degree, that, that is targeted to uh, students, okay? and they are not equal. They are fundamentally very different animals. A lot of time we have this confusion, let's do branding and we don't talk about the audience uh, with that uh, narrow funnel, we don't look at it intently. And this is the challenge that I find most uh, universities face, not all of course, right? Fundamental challenges, number one, universities may not know who they wish to target. There is that confusion, right? They may not use the most suitable platforms for their target audience. And even if they use the, the right tool to look at, to go for their audience, they may not know how the audience works, what is behind them, what makes them tick, 
right? So that's very important. Knowing your audience, knowing what platform will best um, allow you to reach out to them, and knowing how they work, reaching out to them effectively. So these are the three uh, challenges I find a lot of universities face, especially in Asia. I'm going to give you a case study of the University of Newcastle. Right? I'm not going to go through uh, it in great detail because of time constraint, but I'm just going to pick out a few points. This is one of their recent uh, work with us. Right? So they basically wanted to promote um, University of Newcastle's uh, research. Right? And the focus here, if you look at point two, is really making the world a better place. That's sort of the key thing. Right? So you can see their work here, and what they were doing is trying to help uh, people in Bangladesh, basically help them get water that is safe, drinkable water. Possible. And they did it very well with various campaigns, right? They did it very well uh, with, uh, with online campaigns, on magazines, on our website, right? So you can see various uh, campaigns. It's a multi pong approach, right? Importantly, they were able to leverage their website as well, right? They were able to create a visually dynamic and engaging content. Uh, it doesn't show you everything because I'm not able to play some of this, right? It's a PowerPoint. You could see, go to their website, you could see more details, right? They focus on impact on society. So they try to make their research really uh, simple and easily understood by the public. Okay? They use um, their faculty for promotion. So they put all their faculty in the front line. You know, tell me your work, tell me your research, which you see. Right? So, and they play very cleverly with the word new, right? New castles so and new, new players, uh, new pioneers, new uh, re-energizers, new advocates, new release, new surprises. So they're very smart also in helping audience remember uh, their research. And this is what I've said, you know, if you look at Professor Ravi, so he was one of the uh, proponents of this. You know, so he was uh, the star sort of um, researcher on this project and he was asked to explain and share about his research work, right? So this is excellent. So as I alluded to in my earlier slides, right, these are the three fundamental challenges, right? Uh, universities do not know who they wish to target, they may not use the best platforms, and they don't know how to captivate the audience. What about in the case of University of Newcastle? Are they able to tackle this, this, this uh, issues, right? I would say, and you probably agree with me that they've done pretty well, right? And what tells me so? What tells us that they've done very well? So we've done a survey, right? And it, the survey basically asks this question to various academics. Can you recall seeing any efforts or, or media stories in the last month about the university you just selected? In this case, the University of Newcastle. So they actually selected them for the reputation survey and we asked them this question, have you seen them in action? Do they help you think about them? And their average was 68%. 68% said yes. Right? This is way higher than the global average of 55%. So clearly, at least from one, one angle, at least from research, from surveys, you could tell that actually they've done a pretty good job. right? Almost 70% of them have actually seen something about the university, right? And this is one question I want uh, all of us to perhaps think about. We may not have all the solutions today over this uh, 30, 40 minutes call. It's difficult to pack too much inside. But I want you to think about this. You know, are you using the right platforms? Do you know your audience better? Are you able to captivate them, right? And sometimes what universities do, as I've um, shown you in the earlier slide, they do surveys. So this is one done by Tong Dak Tang University. They've done a survey. And they want to reach out to the audience to find out, well, what makes you tick? Do you think about us? What do you think about? Which field, right? So these are very good questions to ask, and you can easily do something like this with your stakeholders. We did one recently with uh, one of the uh, best universities in Taiwan. I've taken out the name because, uh, you know, we signed an NDA with them, and we want to mention too much of that here. So basically, they have done this uh, survey with us as well. And uh, basically, uh, they also want to find out from their stakeholders what Basically, what have they done? Uh, how much do they know about their university? Uh, what do they know about that university? So I think this is good that once in a while you do a bit of audit, you find out what your audience think about you. And you will, interestingly, you'll pro probably be able to find um, a lot of uh, insights from this uh, surveys. Next point, um, and I, I can't um, overemphasize this, different shape, different shape, different shape, right? These are two um, universities. Right, and you would see in their campaign one from the left, University of Waterloo, and the other one on the right, University of Sydney. Right, their campaigns are almost identical, probably done by the same advertising agency. Right, and you could see that it's really similar. And not too long ago, I was at uh, University of Macau and I saw something like this. 
using here as well, you know. So my point to you, um, using just these three um, universities as examples, although they are quite far apart, you know, you see how similar they are in terms of their messaging, right? Um, and you would you find that increasingly it's getting very difficult to, to sort of differentiate yourself and to run to raise above the, the noise, as I mentioned earlier. Brand distinctiveness can be very difficult. Quite often you see these efforts, you know, students in, in green fields, um, studying, talking to your friends. And these are all taken from different universities, by the way, right? It's very difficult because they're all using the same images. It's quite easily forgotten, right? The next moment you turn to the next page. Again, you see this, everyone is doing this, and that's why you shouldn't be doing this, right? Uh, researchers and lab codes of students, everyone is doing this. You see this in Asian universities as well, right? For trained uh, university research and scientists and lab codes. Uh, hopefully you will see less of this in Taiwan after this uh, presentation. Not too long ago, we, we launched a, you know, a ranking supplement, and in that ranking supplement, uh, we were trying to portray the image that these are the best universities in the world on earth, right? And in that supplement alone, you would see that they're very much a, a lot of similar uh, advertisements portraying the sort of the same image. Who says you can't change the world? A young global university, be the change you want to see uh, in the world, world leading minds, and yeah, you could see all the images, right? And sort of the messaging is the same. Every, everyone's talking about being global, top of the world, right? And you could imagine if you see all this in the same supplement, you know, how impressive is it going to be? It's going to be quite minimal, right? Um, not too long ago, uh, we faced a similar issue as well. Everyone has gone from being global to interstellar, right? Everyone is going to space right now. They're looking, reaching out for the stars, right? Go anywhere, right? These are good advertisements. I'm not saying they're bad in any uh, way, right? But if you compare them with the rest, you just do not stand out. You are quite similar to them. I'm going to do another case study very quickly. University of Melbourne, uh, they were promoting their research. Uh, and again, quite similar to the University of Newcastle. It's about how they make the world a better place, right? And you can see that the uh, advertisements are very simple, but yet very different from what we've seen earlier. Yeah, you don't see students in lab coats. You don't see students on the fields. Um, you see this, you know, they're trying to, to um, share with the world about interdisciplinary subjects, when genomics collide with melanoma, when accounting collides with botany, right? How do you calculate CO2 emissions? You know, when two subjects come together, when forestry collides with software mapping, so forest fire is big, you know, in Australia, and how do you tackle that with software mapping? This is excellent in the sense they stand out and they help deliver a very simple message. With clear, concise mood. The next part, uh, events and conferences. Right, pardon me if I'm jumping ahead too fast because uh, quite a fair bit to cover, right? Um, I'm not going to go too much into this segment uh, simply because in the light of the COVID situation and uh, we know that it's very hard for people to travel, events and uh, conferences would have a limited impact. Nonetheless, it is still important, right? It's still an important part of branding and I just want to cover it in a few slides. I think fundamentally, I want to ask the question, uh, which of these are the impactful ones? Obviously, there are many events in the world, and your researchers, they will know which are the best events in physics and, 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 uh, and geography and, and uh, uh, material science. They know which events to go to, right? So I think you really have to find out from your researchers what are the impactful ones, how can you support them? And importantly, ask the question, are you involved in this? Because if these are the biggest you know, uh, events in the world on the particular team. If you're not involved in them, you should be answering the question, why are you not involved in them? More importantly, other than just being involved, what are the key objectives you need to fulfill? Your research, right, and your institution's visibility. These are, I think, of the utmost importance, you know, when you attend these events. We need to think about this. What is the KPI? What is the ROI of attending this event? Obviously, at THE, we participate in many events. In fact, we are privileged to be invited. In fact, we are the only rankings invited for the World Economic Forum for the last five, six years. And you can see many presidents being invited as well, right? Presidents, uh, ministers from around the world, and KG is there to share our data, to give our insights, to interview them. So you need to think about, is your university being, being represented at some of these levels, right? Not necessarily at the World Economic Forum, but at other forums, right? Think about that. 
Uh, we have awards as well. And you could see here that uh, this, uh, this is one of our recent awards. Uh, last year, I was over there at the event. And in fact, I was on the stage uh, on the far left where they gave out the event. One of the universities was not around and collected an award on behalf of them. Now, I guess uh, my point here is that there are events, there are prestigious events, there are events that are very much affordable. So I would urge you to think about this, to do a bit of research and to figure out where you should be sending some of your researchers to, to publicize their work. Uh, nowadays, uh, a lot of events have gone online. Obviously, for THD, we have our events online as well, right? So think about some of these online events. You don't need to travel. That's even better, right? So your, your researchers can actually participate and give uh, panel speeches at some of these events. So again, like what I mentioned earlier, what are your key objectives when you participate in these events, right? For yourself, your research, and your institution. Think about this. Next, very quickly, to mass media and social media. Um, no doubt with this uh, interconnected world and because of COVID, now we are even more connected online, right? Um, there's increasingly more exposure for institutions. Uh, you can see some over here, right? So this on the left, uh, it's uh, China Daily, obviously. On the right, this is uh, one of the more popular, in fact, probably the most popular article for us in the World Economic Forum. We talk about uh, universities that have done well in the recent impact rankings, right? Um, so I'd again like to ask some questions to challenge your, your thoughts, you know. Um, what are the ROIs and KPIs that they are set at the institution level when it comes to getting plugged into the media ecosystem, right? A lot of us, we know that it's not easy to get in the media good books, but if you are not, think about um, why you are not and how do you get in, right? What are your KPIs? What are your ROIs? Are you thriving in this uh, media ecospace? Or is it sometimes taken as a very tokenistic uh, measure? You know, I'm just trying to see that I'm doing something, but actually I'm not getting the results. Who are you benchmarking your efforts with, right? So these are all important questions. You have to address it. And I like to say that this is, I know we have some presidents here. I like to say that this is really something you need to talk about it at the president, you know, at the highest level, because simply sometimes these things have to be pushed top down, you know, for it to work, unfortunately. This is uh, what happens in most companies and institutions. Again, I asked the question, how plug in are you into the ecosystem? You could see again, uh, publicity uh, on mainstream media. Uh, if something happens, you have excellent research. Is it picked up easily by the media? You need to think about this, right? Because you can have the best research in the world, but if no one knows about it, it is pointless, right? Again, you see um, in Vietnam, Saigon, uh, Vietnam's Tong Dat Tang University, they have done very well in the impact rankings. Right. So again, I ask the question, how plugged in are you in the media ecosystem? Right. Think about that. Now, um, I want to give some good examples here, not exactly case studies, but you see um, this is universities on auto, um, auto mode, right? So what happens is they've done well straight away. There's no need for too much discussion. Straight away, you see this. And these are not uh, done by us. These are done by other universities, right? Examples of universities uh, you know, who have done well. It is second nature to them to sort of generate and churn up this within their own ecosystem, within their media ecosystem, because um, this is the least they must do nowadays to, to sort of you know, capture attention and rise above the noise. Again, you see here um, Manchester, these are not small universities. Uh, Elaine will be pleased with this University of British Columbia, University of Gothenburg, McMaster University. They've done well, right? They've done well, um, and, and they just churn this out. Like, this is second nature to them. Now, I have some guides here. I, I don't want to go through everything because, again, you can find this online. Of course, that would be easily available. Uh, I just want to point out two points, right? One is this that increasingly I think universities need to think about really to share not just student experience, but academic experience that's shown the University of Newcastle. I think um, this sort of experiences and stories are very emotive, right? They are much more than you put up text and it's from some third party. If it comes straight from the student, it comes straight from the academics, it means a lot more for people you are reaching out to. So this is really important. The next point I want to share is really uh, creating and sharing uh, great social content, right? Leveraging uh, timely content, it has to be timely, it has to be topical, you know, promote your research, celebrate success, and your star researches, right? Again, this is connected to the earlier point I mentioned. But what I'm trying to draw here is that there has to be a mechanism, there has to be a system because I do face, I do work with universities and they tell me sometimes it's very hard, you know, within my university to get this information because I'm trying to get them, but they are all very busy, you know, they don't want to entertain me. So this is commonly a, a challenge for a lot of universities. 
And I think really the sort of management we need to set something in place so that this is a well oiled mechanism. You don't need to, you don't face a lot of resistance when you want to get such content, especially for your PR, comms team, international office, right? Um, and really providing value for social media is to be you know, measured uh, regularly, is to be benchmarked, and you to set public I think these are all very important nowadays in today's uh, time, today's age. Uh, in fact, we see that they have even gone to another level, right? A lot of universities have gone to virtual, right? They are hosting uh, virtual events. It's for students, you don't have to come to my campus. You want to come to my campus? You don't have to fly. You don't have to travel. You just come online and we'll bring you around. I have someone to bring you around to my campus. And even um, uh, in terms of recruitment, right? So this is done uh, in a very comical way. So there was the Pokemon craze a few years back. and you see people using Pokemon to sort of, uh, you know, draw attention for students, for academics. You know, come to my campus because you will find a lot of Pokemons there, right? That's what they do. So they're going to another level. So if you are not even at this level, I think, you know, there's a need for us to look at some of these things, right? Um, again, I asked the question, how plug-in are you in the ecosystem? Uh, THE, we do help universities get plug in So this is THE Connect, where we uh, use our leverage on our media, uh, social media platforms and we help promote uh, your content, your research, your academics, your students. Uh, um, what I want to share here is uh, a different sort of media. This is uh, sponsored media, right? Increasingly, uh, a lot of universities are doing this. What they're doing is they're doing it uh, in such a way that the advertisement doesn't jump across to you. Like I'm telling you, come, you know, join us, recruit, you know. Uh, it doesn't come across that aggressively. This is a softer tone, right? So what they're doing is a softer approach, a softer manner. And what they're doing is basically we try to blend in their, their sort of a branding or advertisement with the content provided by the website, right? So this is sponsored content, is what we call it, right? You can see various universities. And I want to show you this on the right, right? So this is done with, uh, see in the bottom uh, right, this is done at university, uh, National University of Singapore, right? So they blend in very well uh, with you see at the top, right? And the top talks about the various, I hope you can see my cursor, right? The various um, articles for, about ranking, right? And at the bottom, they have their own uh, sort of a promotion. And it blends in very well. It's almost, it doesn't come across to you like a, it's shouting at you like an advertisement, but it looks like, you know, it's just another article by PhD. And this is the sort of a softer approach we have seen. You know, universities want to uh, be able to portray their research in a very soft, uh, natural way. Again, you see many others, right? Uh, there are too many for me to name here, but I just want to give you sort of a glimpse of what you can find again on our website. You know, we talk about water supply, talk about neuroscience, hospitals, all kinds of stuff, right? Subtly promoting their university in the midst of all this. Right, so that is um, the third point. I'm going to fourth point. We're going to the end, uh, reaching the end very soon. Advertisement. Now, I, I think everyone knows the, about advertisement. So I'm not going to go into detail, but I just want to show you certain formats, certain way you can be creative about your advertisements, right? So we see here, there are mailers, obviously you received hundreds of mailers, you probably put them all in the junk box, right? So these are mailers and some of them are very specific to certain audience. Some of them are very timely, as I mentioned, timeliness is important. So you can see COVID-19, it jumps across your face, you know, everyone is worried about COVID. So what is your university doing about COVID? Now, you'll be interesting to note that City University of Hong Kong, they do not have a medical school. But this is not stopping them from helping fight or combat the COVID situation, right? A lot of universities do not have medical schools in Hong Kong, but they've been doing a lot. Hong Kong Poly for example, they did a 3D, 3D mask and they're promoting that, you know, we are, we are creating 3D masks for, because there's a lack of masks, right? So what is your university doing right now to combat COVID? I think that's really uh, relevant and you can target the specific audience. As I mentioned earlier, um, my earlier point, softer approach. So you can see here Taiwan Tech, what they did was, it's uh, very well blended. So in a way, you could see on the right side, this is our uh, editor, John Gill, and he's talking about AI, right? Talking about technology. But on the left, straight away, you see that College of Engineering, College of uh, Electrical Engineering, Computer Science. There's that relevance there. So it comes in softer, doesn't jump in your face, right? So people would say, hey, yeah, this is something probably more relevant than what I normally expect. It can be very general as well. Nothing wrong with that. It can be very general, right? So National Taiwan Normal University, um, it can be very informative, all right? You can feed them with content, especially if you think that this is content that is very relevant right now, right? So here, NCKU, deployable quarantine hospital, right? So they're talking about things that are very relevant. And people from the West, people, you know, they are, they are equally affected by COVID. 
in Europe and in in US. We want to find out what is happening. Of course, Taiwan has been very successful in combating a uh, COVID situation together with the likes of Hong Kong, South Korea. So really, this is something that people want to learn from. Um, you can play with words, you can play with figures. It's typically what most universities do. Again, this is something for feedback. And I want to share with you something. Now, it is no secret that rankings have been used to uh, for advertisement purposes. They are great advertising tools, right? That's uh, not a secret, right? But there is a secret that I want to share. There are different kinds of rankings. There are many kinds of rankings, and there are awards as well. The question is, are you involved in some of this? And my suspicion is that not all of us are involved because we don't, we don't know about this, or we, we have not jumped in, right? So fair enough, you know, you need to think. Now, I want to talk about the awards because the PhD Awards, uh, Asia Awards, has only been released for two years. Not many people know about this, right? And you could see um, over there on the right, you know, we have expanded the category, Outstanding Leadership Management Team. So it's highlighted here, right? If you want more information, you can just uh, do a uh, capture this zip code and, and you know, you can send you to the link. Uh, but basically, you do see some universities participating in this uh, for the first time, which is good because it does raise the visibility. And importantly, there's no cost involved, right? So this is something that I would encourage all to go for. Um, and it's not just the really the uh, mid-tier or even uh, you know the, the mid-tier universities that are joining. In fact, you see a lot of the prestigious universities joining as well, right? Uh, HKUST, Peking University, NUS, Tokyo University of Science, Heist University of Tokyo, Nankai University, and and there are others, right? So Tsinghua and, and, and some of those and big ones in Japan. So my point is, this is um, it's good to be seen beside some of these universities because they give you the halo effect, right? You're seen beside some of these universities and well, you can even compete with them. That's good, that's good, right? So again, there are many other universities here. You see a, a myriad of universities. I'm not gonna go into all of them, but um, definitely something for you to look at. Now, um, I've come to my last slide, the summary page, and I want to sort of wrap it up because I know we have about 10 minutes left of questions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's really important to know your audience, to know them better, because this is always the fundamental uh, hurdle I find that universities do not know enough and they expect others to, to give them that, that sort of information, right? It may not always work. Differentiate, differentiate, differentiate. This is really important. You need to raise above the, the noise level. There's too much noise right now, right? Uh, events, conferences, impactful ones, really choosing the impact ones and telling yourselves, what is the KPI? Why am I spending time going for events when I'm actually more important research work? That's always the number one question your researchers will, would ask, right? Why am I going there? Spending three days, including travel, right? Um, mass media, social, uh, this is something you must leverage on this. Unfortunately, I can't uh, overemphasize this point because there's too many websites, uh, many social media accounts by universities in Asia, they are not at that level, not even at the basic level. Right, so this is something you have to work on. How do you internationalize some of your websites, some of your content? Think about that. Advertisements, right? So uh, in a nutshell, um, the first two points talk about the strategy. The three points below are platforms. Now there's an additional bonus point I want to, to share with this. And that is a, a, a sort of a, a pitfall I see in most universities. They often have little difficulty jumping into the platforms. What I mean by that is they will tell you, oh, you know, Justin, I want to go on your, your magazines. I want to go and advertise on the website. I want to do social media. I want to do this. I want to do that. But oftentimes, they do not think um, hard enough when it comes to the strategy. It's not done at the top level, right? And that's where you have problem because the strategy has to come before the platforms. A lot of times we see universities doing it the other way around. They think of all the platforms. And it's not surprising because these are very easy to, to talk about. You know, it's very simple. I just choose this, I just choose Twitter, I just choose uh, Weibo, I just choose uh, Tencent, or Baidu, whatever. You know, I just choose some of these platforms, which everyone is doing. But I don't think hard enough when it comes to the strategy, right? And as a result, it's not done properly, right? So I encourage you to think really, uh, put, the, put the horse in front of the cart, right? Really think about the strategy before you tackle the platforms. Platforms are much easier to sort of discuss. So for my closing, um, just the last two slides, uh, the, I want to show you an example of a campaign that has done uh, very well in all these five points I mentioned. Number one, they know their audience really well. Number two, you will see that their brand is really elevated. They stand out. They really differentiate, differentiate, differentiate. Point number three, they didn't just attend events and conferences. They brought the events and conferences and the research to the people, right? Brilliant. 
And point number four, they were big on media. They were big on media, really. And point number five, they managed to advertise themselves very effectively in simple yet thoughtful ways. People understand them. The main person on the street, the main man, uh, the, the reasonable man on the street is able to understand it very quickly, right? And that is, again, uh, by Melbourne. Okay, some of the Australian universities are really excellent, so it's not that I you know, want to choose them, but they're just very good at some of these things, so we can learn from them, right? So you will be able to see more of this later in the video. Um, some of this, you know, you'll be able to see them, and I'm just going to go into that. Uh, before that, I just want to thank you all for listening to me. Before we jump into the video, these are my contact details. You can reach out to THE if you need any support from a ranking perspective, from a recruitment perspective, from a branding perspective. I'm happy to help you in any of these areas. And uh, once again, thank you, uh, Gase, for giving us this opportunity. Over to you, uh, MC. Oh,